Well, I think the best way to explain is really to use a quote from Max Perutz, which I think says it as, as well as, one, as anyone could hope to. He says, why water boils at 100 degrees and methane at minus 161, why blood is red and grass is green, why diamond is hard and wax is soft, why graphite writes on paper and the silk is strong, why glaciers flow and iron gets hard when you hammer it, how muscles contract, how sunlight makes plants grow and how living organisms have been able to evolve into ever more complex forms. The answers to all these problems have come from structural analysis. And what that really means is that we understand why things are the way they are and how they do the jobs they do in the world by understanding exactly how the atoms fit together at the tiniest level of detail. So what an X-ray crystallographer does is first of all take the, the substance that they're interested in and make a very, very pure sample of it. And if you make something pure enough, it will then crystallise. What we mean by crystallising is that the molecules have arranged themselves in a completely orderly way in three dimensions. So once you've got your crystal, you then put it in front of an X-ray beam, fire the X-ray through it, and you surround the crystal uh, with a piece of photographic film. This is how it was done in the early days. Nowadays, there are more automatic ways of doing it, but it's easier to imagine this way. So you put your phot photographic film around it, and the X-ray goes into the crystal, is diffracted by the atoms in the crystal, and comes off in, in all directions in such a way that some of the waves reinforce one another, and when they hit the photographic film, they make a bright spot. You end up with this pattern on your photograph uh, of spots of different brightnesses in different positions. And you then have to analyse the, these spots. And in the early days, this was done entirely by eye. You had a reference set of spots and you held it up against the spots on your photograph and said, well, is it darker or lighter than this one? And then moved on to the next. It was extremely tedious. What you would hope to get from that uh, is a kind of contour map that shows you um, what the density of electrons is as you go through the molecule and that, that's an indication where you've got a lot of electrons that means you've got an atom there. So once you've done that you've got this map you've, you've, you try, try to do it at several layers through the crystal and you can then build up these layers to form a picture of where all the atoms are in the crystal. And then the final stage is usually to build a model uh, in three dimensions using some kind of ball and stick um, technology so that you, you can actually put your model on your desk and turn it around and look at it and have a think about how it might work. X-ray crystallography really began by accident. Um, the first people who fired uh, an X-ray beam through a crystal weren't trying to find out things about crystals at all, they were trying to find out something about X-rays. Uh, that work was done in Germany by uh, a professor called Max von Lauer. Lawrence Bragg in the UK uh, read this paper, this was in 1912, and realised that uh, from looking at the pattern of the spots that you got, you could actually work back to where the atoms were in the crystal. And he and his father, William Bragg, uh, did the first experiment that was really setting out to find out where the atoms in a crystal were. They used common salt, which is a very, very simple crystal. It's only got sodium and chlorine atoms in the same number of each and arranged in a very regular square kind of way. Um, and that was the first experiment in X-ray crystallography. Between the 20s and the 50s, X-ray crystallography became very well established as a tool for finding the structures of mostly small molecules. And it was beginning to be used seriously uh, to address the question of the structure of proteins. Proteins like haemoglobin, the protein that carries oxygen around in the bloodstream, uh, and insulin, the protein that uh, deals with sugar in the body. By 1951, at the time of, of the Festival of Britain, uh, it was possible to demonstrate um, or, or to produce lots of interesting structures for the festival pattern group to work on, some of which, those of the rather smaller molecules such as uh, Helen McGaw had worked on or Gordon Cox, um, were the actual structures you could actually see in 3D arrangement where the atoms were in the structures. In the case of the proteins, insulin and haemoglobin, which Dorothy Hodgkin and Max Perutz provided to the festival pattern group, the, the patterns they, they provided were not actually the structures of the molecules. They, were, uh, they looked like contour maps. They were something that was produced through a technique known as Patterson analysis that gave you some clues about the arrangement of um, areas of density within the molecule, but couldn't really tell you precisely where all the atoms were. 
Well, X-ray crystallography is as important now as it was ever, it, in many ways more important, because one of the results of the Human Genome Project is that we now know uh, all the, 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 the sequences of all the human genes, and every one of those genes uh, translates itself into a protein, and we really don't know the structures of all those proteins. And the hope is that for the future of medicine, uh, by understanding those protein structures, we'll be able to design new drugs to cope with the very intractable diseases that still afflict us, like cancer and, and various kinds of brain disease and so on. What's changed in the way X-ray crystallography is done is really the technology. Um, in order to work with some of these rather difficult crystals, that proteins are not easy things to crystallise, and even when you do, they're usually very, very tiny. You need very intense beams of X-rays. And nowadays, we get those not from the little X-ray tubes that people used to use on their lab benches, but huge, great uh, synchrotrons, like the diamond synchrotron uh, near Oxford, which produce very intense uh, very narrow uh, beams of x-rays that enable you to do your experiment quite quickly and gather all the, all the data that you need. And the other technological um, advance that was absolutely necessary uh, to do crystallography on these, these protein structures uh, was computing, high-speed computing. And in fact, it, it took um, uh, electronic computing to solve both haemoglobin and insulin. There were no protein structures solved before there were computers. Uh, and of course nowadays computing power is so much greater than it was then. So it's almost true to say that nowadays you get your crystal, you bung it in the beam, the data is all collected automatically, it goes straight in the computer and out comes the result. Actually it's not quite as easy as that, but you certainly can solve a protein structure in a matter of weeks. Max Perutz never stopped working on haemoglobin and it took him 22 years.